Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Mike Hearn, head of the Asian Art Department here at the Met. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to a program devoted to our current exhibition in the Chinese galleries, uh, Chinese Art in an Age of Revolution, Fu Baoshi. So it is just a coincidence that I, my talk, which will introduce the exhibition and provide an overview, will be followed by that of a distinguished professor from Boston. So we will have New York and Boston together on a day when those of you who are football fans may realize that there's some symmetry between the Giants and Patriots and uh, New York and Boston here. And it even occurred to me that for those of you who are challenged with Chinese pronunciation, that Fu Bao Shi is very similar to football. <laughs> so Fu Bao Shi was, I think, truly a revolutionary artist. Uh, he not only created a style which was uniquely his own, coming on the back of 2,000 years of Chinese traditional painting, which he was very aware of because he was not just an artist but a scholar of that. Uh, and he lived through extraordinary times. On his seventh birthday, five days after his seventh birthday, the Republican Revolution began and heralded the end of the Qing Dynasty and 2,000 years of imperial rule. Uh, by the time he was a young man, uh, the Republic had been challenged again with uh, the warlords in the North, communist uh, uprisings that Chiang Kai-shek became involved with. Uh, the Japanese began occupying parts of Manchuria in the early 30s, leading ultimately to a full-scale war that lasted from 1937 to 1945. No sooner had the Second World War come to an end that you have the communists and nationalists again fighting, uh, with the ultimate victory of, the, uh, of Chairman Mao and the communists in 1949, uh, followed by, again, enormous periods of social disruption, the Great Leap Forward, uh, until 1965 when Fu Baoshi died, just one year before the Great Cultural Revolution. So this was a life that witnessed enormous turmoil within China, uh, and yet you look at his paintings, and at least through the 40s, up until the time of the revolution, there's almost no hint that there is a world war taking place. And I think we see in the latter half of his career as well, a real effort to balance the political changes that had overwhelmed the country with this man's dedication to tradition and traditional art. So this is a very complicated individual. His Career began early. His father died while he was still a teenager, and he taught himself. He grew up in Nanchang, which is uh, in Jiangxi province. It is not a great cultural center. Uh, Bada Shanren was uh, in Nanchang in the 17th century, but uh, it was far from the mainstream of Shanghai, Beijing, or Nanjing. Uh, and one of the earliest art forms that Fu Baoshi mastered was seal carving. And this is a remarkable example from the exhibition. Uh, it has on its surface, on three sides, 2,700 and some characters, the transcription of a poem written by Chu Yuan, great uh, uh, fourth, third century BC poet, which translates roughly as encountering sorrow. Chu Yuan was a remarkable individual celebrated in China down to this day as an emblem of loyalty. Uh, he was falsely slandered, and in order to prove his innocence, he ultimately embraced stones and threw himself into a tributary of the Xiang River, uh, thus drowning himself. And Fu Baoshi took for his own name Fu embracing stones. So he not only embraced the art of stone carving in seals, but clearly there was a measure of idealism there. Uh, this particular legend, uh, Cai Fang Zhou Xi Du Ruo, is a line from the Li Sao which refers to plucking these sweet or fragrant herbs among the islets. It was in preparation for his journey into the spirit world, into a fantasy world, that Chu Yuan wandered amongst the uh, plants along the riverbank, ultimately choosing to drown himself as a way of entering another dimension. So clearly this was a young man who was deeply idealistic, 
but fundamentally ignorant of traditional Chinese art for the early part of his career. These two paintings date to 1925. They are the earliest extant works of uh, Fu Baoshe, and we can see that they are very crude, simple, untutored examples, using a lot of dots here and horizontal dots there. Uh, here he says he's following a, a 17th century painter named Cheng Sui. Here he claims he's working in the tradition of Mi Fu of the 11th century, whose Mi dots are a particular trait. But I suspect he never saw anything by either of these masters. He probably was working from woodblock prints. So basically self-taught and untutored. When we get to this image of 1943, we see a dramatic transformation. And uh, Aida Wong, who will be following me uh, here this afternoon, is going to be addressing the changes that Fu Baoshi underwent during a period of three years, from 1932 to 35, when he lived in Japan. It's a very ironic moment, because this follows, uh, by about a year, the Japanese army's invasion and occupation of parts of Manchuria. But it was the Chinese government that actually paid for Fu Baoshi to go to Japan. So there was this relationship with Japan that the Chinese saw Japan as this forward-thinking, uh, advanced society who was balancing East and West to their, and their admiration of Japanese scholars for China's tradition. So it was really in Japan that he discovered his own heritage, his own past. And one of the artists he discovered was Shotao. And in fact, this painting, which is now in the Shanghai Museum, is by Shotao. And you can see that this work is actually based very closely upon it. 1943, he was back in China. He must have encountered this example of Shirtao's work. But his sensitivity to Shirtao began in Japan, as did a publishing career. In our exhibition, we have a whole case showing books that Fu Baoshi created, many of them translated from Japanese art history. So he was already eagerly studying uh, the art history of China as filtered through a lens created in Japan. And he was, as a teacher himself, he taught his whole career, elementary, high school, and ultimately college. He wanted to share that knowledge with his countrymen. So this transformation that took place in Japan really reshaped his art and liberated him in remarkable ways. Uh, this is another painting from the 1940s where you can see it's just a lot of blobs of ink to create a sense of the foliage of this mountainscape. It reminds me of a painting by Chertal called 10,000 Ugly Ink Dots. So clearly, this notion of applying ink freely and obviously on the surface, so there's this tension between the representation of the landscape and its uh, pictorial surface, and the interest in texturing, that it is really not conventional in any sense. It really was something that Fu Baoshi developed himself and which he carried forward uh, during the 40s when China was at war with Japan. The nationalist government had withdrawn from Nanjing and was located in Chongqing, in Sichuan province, surrounded by mountains. In order to get there, you go up the Yangtze River through the Three Gorges, and the dramatic mountains, the landscape filled with mist, would have been extremely different from the landscape of his uh, youth in Nanchang, which was rather low, uh, soft hills, waters, canals, so the drama of China's own landscape was an inspiration. But so too was the mist-filled, representational style of Southern Song painting, which he would have encountered in Japan. So Southern Song paintings were cherished in Japan for a long time. And you get this sense of these banks of mist, uh, wonderful use of ink wash, where areas he really departs from the traditional literati style of brushwork to infuse his paintings with this sense of an environment, a sense of atmosphere. He uses techniques like these uh, lines of white, which suggest rain sweeping down out of the clouds, by applying alum to parts of the painting. The alum, as it dries, resists the ink. So when he paints over that with ink wash, it remains unaffected by the ink. So you get this sense of sweeping rain clouds coming in across the landscape. Another thing he does is he has in the, in the landscape, a sense of narrative. Just as with Southern Song painting, there is a kind of drama here. We sense that the servant carrying a jug of wine to his master and a friend who are waiting 
uh, enjoying a, an afternoon in this rainstorm of, of uh, a conversation is something that also grows out of an awareness of China's descriptive traditions in the Southern Song. So I see the landscape, this encounter with earlier Chinese art in Japan, all coming together to inspire him to something that's very different from where he started as a 21-year-old. The other remarkable thing about Fu Baoshu is he became an extraordinary figure painter. Again, he must have encountered examples of figure painting in Japan that inspired him both in subject matter and in style. And this is an image of Chu Yuan, the same poet for whom he dedicated that seal. Uh, as a young man, that was in 1930, the seal. This is 1942. You have to understand that Chu Yuan, because he was an outsider, because he'd been accused of disloyalty, must have been particularly appealing to Fu Baoshu at this period, because in 1938, Fu had joined the uh, wartime cause by becoming part of the propaganda unit of the military commission. But in 1940, he stepped out of that role, refused to join the nationalist government. So here's a man who undoubtedly had his loyalty challenged, and yet clearly he aspired to a level of idealism and patriotism that went beyond party politics. So I think Chu Yuan became an enormously important influence for him as well. We have this young idealist just on about to leave for Japan in 1932, and this image of a haggard, uh, dis distraught uh, Chu Yuan on the verge of suicide in 1942 gives you a sense of the mental turmoil that Fu Baoshu was undergoing. Typically, uh, he also celebrated Chu Yuan uh, through some of these shamanistic poems, the nine songs that celebrate these romantic encounters with goddesses up in the sky. Uh, the Chu Yuan describes these at great length. It probably has a lot to do with the tradition uh, of southern China, of these shamanistic visionary uh, flights of fancy. And pursuing the uh, beautiful goddess was not so different from the Song of Solomon in our Bible. It was interpreted metaphorically as the loyal officials wished to find a leader whom he could attach himself to, to whom he could be uh, uh, really a appropriate official. So the goddess imagery had a double meaning for Fu Baoshu. He clearly appreciated beautiful women. This was actually dedicated to a woman uh, whom he knew uh, as a friend. Uh, she was married woman uh, in Nanjing and who lives in Princeton today. So we're very pleased to see this image of her preserved as a mountain goddess here. But the use of, of poetic images, the use of earlier narratives to uh, inspire him was something that he was brilliant at. This is another celebration of a beautiful woman who was a courtesan who had uh, been forced to leave the capital. One evening, the poet Bai Jui uh, in, uh, overhears her strumming her pipa, her lute, and joins her, and they commiserate because Bai Jui at that point had also been exiled from the capital. So here is a story of people living apart from the capital as exiles, just as the nationalist government had been forced to flee Nanjing for the Shan, uh, Sichuan uh, cap temporary capital of Chongqing. So the themes of uh, Fu Baoshu's paintings clearly fed into his life at that time. Uh, this one is another, I think, very personal reference. Uh, this is a celebration of the Tang Dynasty monk uh, and calligrapher Huai Su, who is famous for his mad calligraphy, his cursive script, done best while drunk. So we see him here in his cups. He's holding a wine cup in his scroll. His brush is readied here. The servant has more wine ready to be poured. There's yet more wine up here in the gourd, I think. And Fu Baoshu himself was known as a tippler. And in fact, if you get up close to this seal in the bottom left corner of the painting, bottom right corner, it says, Wang Wang Zui Ho, which means often after getting drunk. So he applied this to a number of his paintings, particularly those where he's celebrating other famous uh, tipplers of Chinese poetry and the arts. This is an, another remarkable painting in the exhibition that shows Fu Baoshu's growing command over 
traditions that date back to the Tang Dynasty. He's not only celebrating Tang poetry, Tang personages, but in this painting, he almost completely eliminates the background, uses simply a few uh, props, an incense burner, a table, and a screen uh, to create a, a shallow stage. It is the interaction of these figures that really dominates uh, the painting. It gets, gives you a sense of the spatial dimension. They are looking at an image of a Buddha. And I suspect that Fu Baoshi was familiar with one of the famous paintings in Japan. It was a series of images of the 500 Lohans. And those 500 Buddhist uh, spiritual uh, masters, one such painting, they are looking, there's a group of five of them looking at a very similar image of a Buddha. So he may have seen the actual painting, which was in the Daitokuji in Kyoto. He may have seen reproductions of this, but he completely transforms that, rearranges that into a typical Chinese literati gathering. And certainly there were gatherings like this in wartime Chongqing, where men who were brought together by their love of traditional culture could practice these kinds of gatherings. What is fascinating about this as well is that he follows an, a Tang and early 10th century uh, formula of creating a painting within the painting. So he has as a tour de force here, men playing uh, a game of chess uh, painted on the screen within the larger painting. So clearly he's familiar with works of art of China's great tradition, mostly I suspect through publications, probably many of those published first in Japan. Another powerful image is uh, this encounter, this Zen-like encounter between a military man and a Buddhist sage. Uh, again, this notion of how does one seek enlightenment, how does one choose uh, one's own mentors was something that uh, Fu Baoshi must have been concerned with. And I suspect that he was very much inspired by the Zen or Chan Buddhist paintings from China that he would have seen in Japan. This is from the Met's own collection, dates to about 1250 AD and it is an encounter between a Confucian official and a, a Zen master. Notice how schematic and sketchy the landscape is. The same kind of landscape details are created here, so there's a sense of spontaneity uh, in the way the painting is executed that resonates with the Zen ideal of spontaneous enlightenment. So all of these influences we see percolating through Fu Baoshi's art, and he draws inspiration from them, recreates them to celebrate something of China's great traditions at a time when China's traditions were under military attack. Now, this life, that world changed dramatically in 1949, when on October 1st of that year, Chairman Mao declared the founding of the People's Republic of China. And during the next uh, almost two decades, decade and a half, Fu Baoshi lived through the extraordinary transformations of society that took place under communism. And we see that even in his seals, he continued to carve seals throughout his lifetime that express something of his personality, something of his mindset. And these two were surely carved uh, in the early 50s or later 50s that reflect this new social ideals. Uh, this one says, Ji uh, Ti Chuang Zuo. And this one is Bu Ji Wan Yi. So this is uh, creative, uh, collective creativity. So the whole idea of collectivization that had became uh, important in the mid 50s uh, is reflected in this seal. And this one may be translated as not as good as being one in 10,000. So playing down the cult of the individual and saying, I'm just one with the masses. Both of these clearly socialist ideals of, of the 50s. And so in his art, we see Fu Baoshi actually continuing very effectively to use his uh, wonderfully creative landscape and figural style uh, throughout the 50s. But in order, to, in order for the censorship not to come down on him, in order for him to perpetuate this style, and I think also, to be fair, he probably was moved by Chairman Mao, just as Andre Malraux was, just as many Western intellectuals were. In the 50s, there was this sense of a new uh, rebirth, a new China. And so I think that there is genuine celebration of what's happening in China and the history that led up to the communist takeover. Uh, in many of his early paintings, he is following 
the subject matter of poems composed by Mao Zedong, and many of them celebrate the Long March, this uh, heroic effort on the part of the communists in 1934 to make their way uh, fleeing from Jiangxi, Hunan area, through the mountains of Sichuan and up to wartime capital of the communist in Yan'an. So here is a communist uh, army fording one of the rivers in Sichuan. Uh, this is another such image where the soldiers, we see them climbing across the snowy pass of one of the Sichuan mountains. Most of the people never survived this long march, but those who did were, became the core cadre of the communist movement uh, after 1949. This image was clearly inspired by Japanese paintings. On our labels, we can, you actually can see a, a parallel. But what is really interesting to me is that the Japanese image is inspired in turn by a work by Liang Kai of the 13th century, Chinese artist who you see travelers going through a wintry landscape with these blasted uh, naked trees. So there's this reaching back into the past through the lens of Japan, but always with the touchstone of earlier Chinese models, I think, at heart. Now, Fu Baoshu, during the same period, the early 50s, continued to paint works that resonate with his earlier attachment to the mythology, uh, the, the imagery of Chu Yuan and the Nine Songs. This is one of the Xiang goddesses, the beautiful fan that was given to a fellow artist. So privately, Fu Baoshu continued to paint in the way he always had. But clearly, there was a public and private dichotomy in his art. And we see that in the mid-50s, on your left is a painting of landscape pure and simple, very much in the style of Chautal, 17th century. 1957, he travels to Eastern Europe for several months, and he's painting in the style of the New China. You add a cable car to a Chautal landscape, and you have a work of the New China. <laughs> and he became clearly very adept at juggling these images, uh, he was now moved to celebrate factory cities with smokestacks belching smoke, which was, of course, a symbol of progress during the 50s. So this Romanian city was something that uh, moved him. Also, how often have you seen Chinese paintings of airports? This is Irkutsk, and he talks about the, the Chinese and the Soviet airplanes landing and taking off in this great symbol of Soviet, Sino-Soviet uh, cooperation that he experienced and commemorated in a painting. So uh, we have to wonder that some of these must have been uh, motivated by political circumstances. How do you come back from Eastern Europe filled with the new spirit of, of, uh, of communist socialist ideology? And it, it informs all of his paintings to one degree or another that have any kind of public dimension. This is uh, his, an image of his uh, adopted home of Nanjing, the former capital of main, uh, sorry, of the nationalists. And you notice again that all these little smokestacks, probably it was done uh, to reflect something of the great leap forward where the idea of these backyard steel furnaces or, or foundries were being created. Ultimately, it was just melting down the, the pots and pans that people had to create uh, to sort of lift up the production of uh, steel and metal in China. Uh, also, the prominence of the telephone poles here is another sign that modernism has come to China, uh, even though we still see the city wall of Nanjing in place. And over here in the corner, this is the real political message. There is a group of young people with their red bandanas on going to a shrine for the martyrs of the communist revolution who had been actually put to death on the Yuhuatai, the, the the uh, terrace of raining flowers overlooking the, the southern part of Nanjing. So always a, an opportunity to balance this wonderful drama of the foreground trees with content that would have been politically accessible or acceptable. This one, of course, needs no introduction. This is Chairman Mao swimming across the Yangtze River, something he did to prove his own continued uh, uh, stamina. Uh, during the late 50s, and this was inspired directly by a photograph in one of the uh, newspapers of the time, but we see how Fu Baoshu has turned into this wonderful mist-filled landscape as well. So clearly he was uh, partially motivated by the political expediency of, of 
creating works that would have been acceptable to the censors of the time. He was teaching at a university. In order to, to teach, I'm sure he had to prove himself as a loyal uh, communist, if not a party member. His true apotheosis as a creator of the imagery of China itself came in 1959, the 10th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. A great new hall for the people was built on Tiananmen Square. It was to be the headquarters of the Chinese government. And Jiangsu province, where Nanjing is located, contributed, among other things, a hall with decoration in which Fu Baoshi was placed in charge of creating a mural. That mural is here. Here's President Nixon and Pat Nixon, Henry Kissinger with Zhou Enlai standing in front of the completed mural. What is in the exhibition is actually a, a small study, preparatory drawing for this great political work. And you can see how, again, Fu Baoshi has very carefully melded this wonderful traditional landscape style. It's a wonderful panoramic view out over the snowscape of the distant mountains. We see the Great Wall in the foreground. And right here, pine, blossoming plum, and bamboo, the three friends of wintry weather, are traditional harbingers of, of renewal that comes with springtime. So he's using traditional imagery to suggest the new dawning of an age of uh, communist idealism. And of course, that is also heralded by this new use of red color in the sky. This is undoubtedly facing east, and every uh, child in China would have immediately started singing Dong Fang Hong, which means the east is red, uh, Dong Fang Hong, uh, Tai Yang Qi, Zhong Guo Chu Le Yiga Mao Zhu Xi. Uh, the east is red, uh, the sun is rising, China has produced a Chairman Mao. So Chairman Mao is the sun the emblem of the sun that hovers over the new China that brings warmth and renewal to the country. Well, by celebrating the beauty of that, uh, that poem, which by the way is, was titled uh, Jiang Shan Ru Ci Duo Jiao, such is the beauty of our landscape, of our rivers and mountains, it enabled Fu Baoshi to take his students on trips into the countryside, travel around China, and to paint the landscape of China itself. So it gave him a kind of carte blanche to make these travels. And here he is going up to close to the North Korean border in Jilin province to celebrate the landscape that had never been painted by traditional Chinese artists before. Nobody had ever gone that far north. And this amazing uh, uh, northern uh, forest that he encountered with the distant uh, snow-capped mountains and the. Uh, really inspired him. And we have a sense of the scale of this, these trees when we see these little dots here, are actually the busts and figures that are moving towards the distant snow-capped mountains. So the celebration of the natural landscape became one of the themes that he adopted in the uh, early 60s. This is about 1961. Of course, he was being escorted by communist cadre who pointed out to him, isn't this coal mine beautiful? So there he was. What could he do? He had to paint the coal mine as well to admit that that also was a fit subject for artists. So constantly we see this balancing act between celebrating nature. Here's a great image of Mount Hua, Hua Shan, a sacred mountain of the West, one of the great symbols of China's uh, traditional uh, love of landscape, also an emblem of Taoism, spiritual and mystical conjunction of culture and nature. Uh, but at the same time, many of his images celebrate mountains that had a newer set of associations. This is Jingangshan, which is one of the early outposts of the communist revolution. And it's interesting, in Chairman Mao's poem, again, it's based on a, a Mao poem, it talks about red flags and ramparts, but you can barely find a little red house here, a little watchtower there. There's almost nothing political in this painting. It is a celebration of China's magnificent landscape. The political message is the inscription. Everybody who would see it would say, oh, that's, we know what that is. But the artist himself did not choose to turn it into some kind of jingoistic image that celebrated the party. This is 1964 at this point. 
it's close to the end of the artist's life. It's also a moment when I think the Great Leap Forward was proven to have failed. Tens of millions of people had starved. I think the earlier illusion that China was being reborn into a better society was now being tested by an increasingly leftist and harsher uh, environment for artists to, to work. So I see this kind of imagery as something that suggests Fu Baoshe's clinging to his own artistic independence. On the other hand, what do you do with this? From the same year, here is this uh, uh, Chen Kun Chur. This is a celebration of the Earth sailing through the cosmic ocean. And there is China at the heart of the Earth. Uh, and of course, the entire globe has been turned into a communist ideal society. So this kind of obviously political statement uh, shows us that Fu Baoshe could not or did not choose to be aloof from the politics of the day. He couldn't, It's my assumption. So we often uh, also see in this exhibition the, the, this balancing act that's taking place. Here he is celebrating Yan'an. Yan'an in uh, Shanxi province was the wartime capital of the communists where Chairman Mao really forged the the ruling elite of the party that would uh, control China for the next uh, 30 years. And you see the, they lived in these primitive uh, dugout caves in the Lurs soil. And there's a pagoda that is famous monument there. And we see that the rising sun is casting this into a red glow. Clearly, red is a political message in this painting. But one of the last paintings Fu Baoshe created, and the last painting in the exhibition, says, creates a very different kind of message. This is the outskirts of Nanjing. It is the mausoleum of Sun Yat-sen, the founder of the Republic of China, the man who created, he's called the Guofu, the father of our nation. The, uh, the three democracies were an ideal that he espoused. He lasted as a political leader a very short time, and China was, again, thrown into turmoil very quickly after his death. Uh, but the idealism of that uh, man and his vision for China that transformed literally his revolution was the one that ended the imperial state and created a new democratic republic. What well, we see in this image is that there are very few dots of red. There are a couple of, maybe one red flag there. But what is so ominous about this is that the encroaching forest, the dark ink of the the forests, the trees that surround this mausoleum, which is this brilliant white marble with blue uh, uh, roof tiles. It's a vast space, but here we feel it constrained and constricted. For me, it's a very strong political statement. I contrast it with the politically more, uh, let's say, acceptable vision of Yen An. And one sees right away that in this last painting, in the exhibition, we see Fu Baoshe, I think, showing something of what Chinese artists have long done. And that is, especially today, Chinese artists are constantly walking a thin line. They're always testing where is the boundary between what will be censored and forbidden and where personal freedom can exist and carve out a, a space. And when we think that this man's whole career began with a celebration of an outsider, somebody who was willing to die to prove his loyalty against false slander, that he espoused a set of ideals that I think uh, rose above the sense of honor, well, it espoused honor and purity in a time when uh, political expediency was the order of the day. So I feel that like artists today, Fu Baoshe was forced in some cases to create images that spoke to the political necessity of his circumstance, but that ultimately the images that he created have a subtext that we can read and recognize that this man was not only an artist of great genius, but a man who had to balance the political and social challenges of his day and still create a body of work that makes him one of the best known artists in China and one of the most beloved artists of the 20th century. Thank you. Now, I'd like to uh, take a, a further moment to 
introduce our next speaker, Aida Yuan Wong. Uh, got her PhD at Columbia, uh, and then became a visiting professor at Vassar for one year before uh, starting as professor of Asian, East Asian art history at Brandeis, where she's been now for nearly a dozen years. Uh, she did her dissertation on a topic that uh, is really the reason why we've invited uh, Aida to come today. She has studied the interaction between China and Japan that was so seminal, so uh, influential to a whole generation, several generations of Chinese artists who found in Japan models to, uh, to bridge the gap between East and West, and in fact to rediscover something of their own tradition as, as tempered and re-experienced through the Japanese model. Her dissertation topic was Inventing Eastern Art in Japan and China. So the whole idea of what is East Asian art is a topic. Uh, she was covering the time period from 1890s to 1930s. In 2006, she published a, a book-length study called Parting the Mists, Discovering Japan and the Rise of National Style Painting in, Ch in Modern China, which is exactly the topic that Fu Baoxiu lived out through his life. Uh, she's more recently been editor of a volume that will be coming out shortly entitled Visualizing Beauty, Gender, and Ideology in East Asian Culture. Uh, she's an author of numerous essays and articles as well. And uh, this year she is going to be uh, traveling to China for a full year on an NEH grant, which will enable her to study another significant Chinese figure, cultural figure of the early 20th century, Kang Yo Wei. So it is a great pleasure for me to welcome Aida Wong. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm tremendously pleased to be speaking here today. I know that uh, I've come from Boston on this very sensitive day. <laughs> and uh, I've come in, in peace, I assure you. <laughs> so please treat me kindly. And depending on how things go to this evening, your forgiveness will be much appreciated as well. The study of modern art history is now at a historical juncture where we are veering from a nation-centered framework to one that recognizes the heterogeneity of different zones of intercultural contact. At the same time, the conventional East-West binary that favors a hierarchical regime of transmission from a Western center to Eastern peripheries is shown to be increasingly inadequate for explaining reciprocal responses, hybridity, and ambivalence. The art of Fu Baoxi demonstrates a complex psychology of modern art and the creation of a modern aesthetic beyond Euro-American norms. I, uh, I'm very grateful for this chance to speak about Fu Baoxi, who is regarded as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, ink painters of modern China, and certainly my personal favorite. He had consummate techniques, and he was a bold explorer of styles, as well as one of China's earliest art historians. This talk considers Fu Baoxi's special relationship with Japan, where he lived for two and a half years and explored and discovered artistic expressions that left lifelong imprints on his work. Japan was a popular destination in the early 20th century for Chinese students seeking new knowledge. Here we have a photograph of Fu Baoxi dressed for the role. He wears a Western style coat jacket with shiny leather shoes and slick back hair, looking quite smashing. But this image belies the fact that he lived quite poorly on government donations, donated funds, and was frequently, according to records, hungry. 
In June 1933, Fu ran out of money and had to go back to China until he could raise more funds. What did he do in Japan? On his first trip, he was simply taking in all that Japan had to offer, going to museums, the art schools, libraries, as well as collecting paintings, uh, books, books on paintings, as well as um, um, scholarly publications. Then several months into his second trip, spring 1934, he enrolled in the Imperial School of Fine Arts and took classes in painting, sculpture, and art history. Many of the things he learned in Japan and also from Japanese publications would, in various degrees, influence his range of styles and subject matter. In our current exhibition are works that bear close resemblance to Japanese composition. The Falling Leaves in the 1961 Two Goddesses of Xiang River recall Uemura Shouen's Flower Basket. Chu Yuan of 1942 brings to mind Yokoyama Taikan's earlier treatment of the same subject. Both show the ancient Chinese poet statement hero about to commit suicide by walking into a river, a moment seldom depicted in painting. And Shirle seeking the way circa 1945, presents two conversing figures, one red-robed in a forest clearing reminiscent of Hashimoto Kansetsu's Visiting the Hermit, 1930, even though the brush styles of the two pictures are quite different. Fubaoshi was particularly drawn to modern Japanese paintings that incorporated folkloric, literary, and historical motifs. While Fu Baoshi rarely just copied his prototypes, the eclectic range of such paintings produced in Japan provided useful examples of how one might layer new over old, exotic over the familiar. In his book, art historian Zhang Guoying illustrates the variety of ways Fu altered Japanese originals, such as changing the format from a hand scroll to a hanging scroll, adding or subtracting motifs, modifying colors, rearranging details, and so forth. Why does an artist repeatedly borrow from another culture? Regarding Fu Baoshi's striking reiteration of Taikan's evening snow on the river in The Far Snows of Minshan Only Make Us Happy, one Chinese scholar asserted that it was an instance of Fu Baoshi feeling disoriented and lacking life experience, sheng huo ti yan, granting that this was a more literal adaptation of a Japanese composition than usual Fu Baoshi was already 50 years old when he painted the work. So to say that he lacked life experience, presumably of mountain snow, seems too facile and dismissive. Perhaps for many people today, even among specialists, the idea that a major Chinese master uh, indebted to Japan is still hard to accept after Japan's invasion of China in World War II. In this talk, I shall address Fu Baoshi's adoption and transformation of Japanese models as self-conscious acts that reflected his education and politics. Over the course of Fu Baoshi's career, two prevalent tendencies evolved. For figure painting, he revered the ancient Chinese masters, Master Gu Kaiju and his manner of depicting ethereal females wearing fluttering garments and wind-lifted sashes. 
This is a copy of Gu's famous piece, or attributed to him, Admonitions of the Instructress to the Court Ladies, in the British Museum collection. Second tendency, for landscape, for devoted substantial energy to the investigation of watery effects, notably of pouring rain. These two interests converge in a work such as Mountain Spirit, 1946. Fu's appreciation of both Gu Kaiju and dramatic water themes both turned out to have significant ties to Japan. Gu Kaiju and his ammunition scroll, another detail here, became very well known to the Japanese in the uh, 20th century around 1910, after the British Museum had just acquired this rare painting, it commissioned a team of Japanese woodblock printers to produce 100 replicas for sale. Several years later, two prominent Japanese painters, Maeda Seisong and Kobayashi Koke, spent almost two months copying this work. Their copy and photographs of the scroll were widely published in Japan in the 1920s and 1930s. Fu's own investigation of Kukaiju occurred around this time. In 1934, Fu enrolled in the graduate program in Tokyo's Imperial School of Fine Arts, mainly to study art theory and oriental art history with Professor Kimbara Seigo, whose extensive scholarship included studies of Gukaiju. Art history in early 20th century China was a nascent field. Several basic texts produced in China at the time were translations or rewritings of Japanese scholarship. After Fu returned to China in 1935, he continued to study and translate Kimbara's writings. Also worth mentioning here is that Kimbara authored Kaiga Nyo Keru Sen no Kenkyo, 1926-7, a book dedicated to the study of line, study of line in painting. Fu himself admitted that it was during this time as Kimbara's student when he began to seriously pay attention to the formal possibilities of line. In 1942, at this breakout exhibition in Chongqing, Fu discussed having overcome initial struggles to endow lines with different speeds, pressures, and thicknesses, variations he richly explored in his subject's clothing. For example, in Ode on Chang'an, 1944, collection of the Imperial Palace Museum, here we see on the right a detail. Delicate lines, delicate and light lines form the silhouette. Okay. Heavier and emphatic lines bring out the color and the edge of the sleeves. And curly and swooshy ones add interest to the folds. The virtuosity of Fu's brushwork is most evident in his landscapes of watery themes. His signature motif is rain, sometimes a light drizzle, other times a raging storm that washes over tall mountains and suffuses the atmosphere with emotional intensity. He uses more than one technique to achieve such uh, meteorotic dramas. In which whispering rain at dusk, he saturated his brush with diluted ink and paints diagonally down in broad sweeps over a ground of textured rocks. The gestures are bold and exuberant. He was probably drunk. As Mike explained that he created a seal 
with these words, wang wang, zui ho, literally meaning often after being drunk, and they fix one of the seals on the painting you see on the screen. Another technique, my favorite, can be seen here, Mist and Rain on Dialing River, 1940s, involves splashing alum water that inhibits the absorbency of the paper, resulting in translucent descending marks that mimic falling rain. Another example, bamboo grove and misty rain. You see an enlargement of detail from the lower part of the painting here at right, where the alum trails are subtler and convey a softer, more poetic mood. The rainscape among his earliest, or this rainscape, was supposedly inspired by a natural storm. Making rainwater visible is highly unusual in the Chinese painting tradition. More typical landscapes in rain, such as Wang Yu's Summer Mountains in Mist and Rain and Shen Zhuo's Mountain and Stream in Mist and Rain of the 18th and 19th centuries employed wet, short strokes laid sideways, long, known in the Chinese painting lexicon as Mi Dots, that uh, uh, Mike also mentioned, named after the inventors Mi Fu and Mi Ren of the Song Dynasty. The blurriness of the Mi Dots suggests a moistened atmosphere rather than represent rain, per se. In fact, for the most part, Chinese painters prefer to conceive watery elements by implication. That which is left unpainted as white space is water. Clouds and mists. As seen in this work by Fu Baoshi's older contemporary, Gu Lin Shi. But to, to Fu Baoshi, these conventional methods fail to bring out what he called the shen yun, the spirit resonance of water. The modern philosopher and professor of aesthetics, Zhong Bai Hua, praised Fu as the foremost master of water, saying, seeing his painting of water is like hearing a sound. Art historian David Clark calls Fu Baoshi the first Chinese painter to consciously foreground water as a theme and to allow water as medium and subject to encounter one another. In Chinese imagination, rain is associated with sadness, exile, separation, and disappointment. Falling rain is likened to the shedding of tears. Let's hear from Fu Baoshi's favorite poet, Xu Yuan, in a lyric poem titled The Mountain Spirit, also a major subject in Fu's painting. Oh, gloomy and dark is the day. The east wind drifts and the spirits send down rain. Waiting for the divine one, I forget to go home. The year is late, who will now bedeck me? I pluck the three flowers on the mountain side. The rocks are craggy and the vines tangled. Complaining of you as sadly I forget to go home. You are thinking of me, but you have no time. The person in the mountains, fragrant with polia, drinks from the rocky spring, shaded by pines and firs. You are thinking of me? but then you hesitate. The thunder rumbles and the rain darkens, the gibbons mourn, howling all the night. The wind whistles and the trees are bare. I am thinking of my lady. I sorrow in vain. This poem is the last of the nine songs in Xu Yuan's Songs of the South, Chu Tzu. 
These lyrics were originally sung in shamanistic rituals devoted to the worship of mountain spirits in the ancient Chu kingdom. The songs describe the theme of love to denote a fleeting relationship between a mountain spirit and a spirit medium. Here, the imagery is dark with gloom, with rain gushing from the sky against the sound of rumbling thunder and howling beasts. The elusive mountain spirit brings sorrow to the heart. Fu produced many versions of the scene, such as the one from 1946 we saw earlier. Pursuing the elusive lady at the distance behind are her servants and suitor riding on a chariot, riding a chariot drawn by a tiger and a leopard. According to Fu's inscription at left, very small, um, this rendition of the scene was among those that he found relatively satisfactory. The war with Japan had ended just a year before, and Fu had been residing in Chongqing in Sichuan province for eight years since 1939. Chongqing was the wartime base of Guomindang, Nationalist Party government. During this period, Fu lived out the war with his expanding family, engaging in anti-Japanese resistance and conducting research, practicing and exhibiting art and teaching at the National Central University. Life during this period must be like the mountain spirit whose charm equaled the hardship endured in seeking it. As though to question his own sentimentality, he asked in the inscription, isn't there really, isn't there really a mountain spirit? As Mr. Hearn has pointed out, Fu Baoshi made this extraordinary seal. You can see that we have an enlargement of the detail on the right, and the seal face text below, plucking the polia on a flat mountain, right, which we have read uh, from uh, previous from the previous a uh, previous slide, mountain spirit. But most remarkable is the inscription engraved on the three vertical sides of this thumb-sized stone containing more than 2,760 minuscule characters from another poem attributed to Chu Yuan titled Li Sao on encountering sorrow. The enlarged detail on the top right shows how each character is carved with precision and calligraphic flair, despite the impossibly tiny dimension. Please don't miss this uh, masterwork of micro carving when you visit the gallery upstairs. The wartime turmoil and natural scenery of Chongqing inspired Fu Baoshu's unique treatment of landscape. Known as the mountain city, Chongqing has a hilly terrain and overlooks the confluence of the Yangzi and Jialing rivers. It was while living there that he discovered and developed his unique brush technique for achieving rich textures named Baoshi strokes. Using hard and long horsehair brushes, his favorite being manufactured, uh, those manufactured by the Japanese stationery shop, Kyokyodo, he painted in different speeds and weight so that the strokes were light and heavy, turning and pausing, forming dry strokes and blanks. Ink painting, in order to achieve certain effects, we not only need the right ink, but also the right paper and the right brush. And the horsehair brush, this hot um, bristles, able to produce uh, sometimes this very dramatic texture uh, that Fu Baoshi takes full advantage of in his painting. In his 1940 article, The Development of Painting Theories in China, Fu described the loose brushwork of 12th and 13th century Southern Song painters as a language of resentment at the time of invasion by northern tribes, referring back to this 
period and talking about loose brushwork being language of resentment. His own deployments of loose brushwork likewise expressed nationalistic sentiments in combination with landscapes assaulted by torrential rain. It became a powerful metaphor for China's struggles under Japanese invasion. So the landscape itself is crying. Depicting physical rain in a freshing cascade was not unprecedented. For example, the Mingqing individualist Xi Tao, one of Fu's heroes, had touched upon the theme in this album titled Landscapes Inspired by Du Fu's Poetic Sensibilities. Sorry about the blurry slides. I took this off the internet to work. The uh, album was recently auctioned. Um, but the portrayal, you see here, particularly this leaf, was, was rather modest and rainscape would remain a minor subject in Chinese painting before Fu Baoshi. His Ch Chinese predecessor preferred to allude to the impact of rain as effect than to display it physically. Moreover, Fu had limited access to the original works by Shi Tao. His knowledge of the master came primarily from written sources, including Japanese publications, notably a pioneering monograph by the painter Hashimoto Kansetsu, published in Japan in 1926. We have also encountered Kansetsu earlier in the slideshow. Art historian Guo Hui's analysis of Fu's research from 1935 on shows that his focus on Shi Tao was mainly textual, scrutinizing his inscriptions and biography, for example. Furthermore, among the works that Fu did create in reference to Shi Tao's life and writings, such as Landscape in the Style of Shi Tao, only one or two explicitly claim to imitate Shi Tao's style using the word fang, right, uh, modeled after somebody. Right? So this work, um, as Mike has shown as well, explicitly imitates a work now in Shanghai. But none of the Shi Tao inspired paintings shows dramatic rainscapes. So to what Besides his own imagination, could Fu Baoshi have turned for guidance when conceptualizing such scenes? Only a few Chinese painters of Fu's generation tackled rainstorms. Two of them were Gao Jianfu in Same Boat Through Wind and Rain, 1935, and his disciple Feng Ren Ding on the road in Rain and Wind, 1932, masters of the Lingnan School. This school was founded in Canton, southern China, and its chief exponent, Gao Jianfu, joined Sun Yat-sen's campaign to overthrow the Qing imperial dynasty in 1911. The Lingnan School's embrace of revolutionary ideals became the basis of a Xin Guo Hua, which means a movement of new national painting that experimented with modern subjects and styles. Fu Baoshi was Gao's colleague at the National Central University in the late 1930s and 1940s. And he also shared with him and a few other Lingnan masters the experience of studying in Japan. Many of the quote unquote national style paintings of the Lingnan masters display unmistakable Japanese flavors. Just a, a random example Ga Jianfu, Lingnan School Mantis Under the Moon, compares very closely with Matsubayashi Keigetsu's flower shadow on a spring night. As Sano-Japanese political relations deteriorated, the Japanese aesthetics of the Lingnan masters drew criticisms. Gao Jianfu vehemently defended his basic approach as something originated in China, saying that 
The kinds of Japanese art he adopted were themselves based on Chinese traditions, which to some extent certainly true. Gao Sandocentric insistence aside, however, the debt the Lingnan school would owe to Japanese art are palpable in many cases. Uh, the treatment of the full moon and the haze uh, feels very, very Japanese. As mentioned earlier, Chinese painters generally held back the rushing cascades and such physical attributes of rain. But in Japan, heavy downpours found more than a few notable expressions. You may know this work. Hiroshige's famous print, Sudden Shower Over a Take Bridge, in the 1850s, come to mind. More recent precedents for Fubaoshi could include works by Tomoyoka Tesai, such as Summer Landscape, 1912, wherein pouring sheets of rain shatter the peaceful silence of a mountain retreat. Tessai was arguably the biggest name in Japanese literati painting of the early 20th century. No doubt, Fu knew his works. And we know that Tessai befriended several Shanghai painters and commissioned seals by people such as Wu Changshi. So he's clearly somebody uh, that the Chinese painters, Chinese painting world would be familiar with. An even likely inspiration was Yokoyama Taikan, whose frequent traces in Fu's paintings have already been noted. Taikan first learned to prioritize atmospheric effects around the turn of the century under the guidance of Okakura Tenshin, a founding administrator of the Tokyo School of Fine Arts, as well as of the Japanese Art Institute the two premier art organizations in modern Japan. Speaking of trends that began as early as the 1890s, art historian Victoria Weston writes that the monthly topic set for the small societies created at the Tokyo School of Fine Arts and at the Japanese Art Institute often address meteorological conditions. The art school's idea research society, a special society within the school, assigned many topics with strong sensory components, especially sound, while at the art institute, the subjects were atmospheric, temperateness, windy rain, and so forth. Depiction of atmosphere was the strength of Western oil painting. We think Turner, for example. Yokoyama Taikan and Hishida Shinso were to redress what Okakura saw as a weakness in Japanese painting. The Tokyo School of Fine Arts was established in 1889 to initially teach only Japanese style paintings, that is to say, paintings using traditional format, traditional medium, like uh, ink and brush. In 1896, a professorship of Western painting was awarded to Kuroda Seiki, a returnee from France and an aristocrat with liberal ideas. So then um, he, not only did he occupy this major position in the Tokyo School of Fine Arts, he introduced Impressionism, Impressionism into the Japanese academic mainstream. Ensuing decades included our debates from ensuing decades included how Japanese style painting could compete and distinguish itself as a nationalist paradigm. Some argue that it should rise above the conventional genres and reach new expressions of ideas and thoughts. Okakura urged Taikan and his other followers to celebrate the wonders of the Japanese land and sea. And they invented a new way of representing, of representation that was simultaneously naturalistic and evocative. This became known as the Hazy style. They also regarded the blurry effect as a departure from standard Chinese landscape models and as a symbol of awakened spirituality and nationalist emotions, Japanese nationalist emotions. Taikan 
emerged as one of the leading champions of Japanese supremacy, tirelessly repeating the image of a romanticized Mount Fuji and even financed the war effort with his works. In 1940, in commemoration of the 2600 year anniversary of Japan's purported founding, Taikan gave a solo exhibition of a series of 20 paintings, 10 mountains, Mount Fuji's, and 10 sea views. The proceeds of 500,000 yen went to the military to pay for fighter planes named Taikan. Hashimoto Kansetsu, another Japanese who's uh, with discernible influence on Fubaoshi's art and scholarship, also harbored imperialist sentiments. Kansetsu was on the panel of judges for the massive sacred war art exhibition of 1939 and 1944, which included his own large-scale paintings on war themes. It seems bizarre that a patriot like Fu Baoshi should be so taken by Japanese art during and after the era of Japanese imperialism. He himself was very aware of the problem. Speaking to a public audience at Nanjing University in 1951, Fu brought up the idea of national form, saying, quote, in what directions should or could national forms develop? Westernization, Japanization, or traditional tendencies? Japanization is perhaps not what the majority would accept, unquote. Fu did not explain why he, did, uh, he still chose to Japanize his paintings. One might argue that his appropriations were incidental or purely formalist decisions, and that he was not making connection between style and nationalist ideology. I maintain, however, that Fu consciously put himself in dialogue with the Japanese art world to ultimately repudiate Japan's nationalist supremacy. Since Japan's decimated China's Navy at the First Sino-Japanese War in 1894-95, there was a prevalent sense among the Japanese that their country, not China, was the true heir to the ancient Chinese glories, which may also account for the respect still accorded traditional Chinese culture, even after China itself had been discredited. In the 20th century, Chinese with literati skills continue to enjoy in Japan a cordiality not apparent in the treatment of Westerners. On May 10, 1935, when Fu opened a solo exhibition at the prestigious Matadakaya department store in Ginza, Tokyo, the event drew many luminaries of the Japanese art world, among them, Yokoyama Taikan, who stayed for three hours. The viewers marveled at Fu's incredibly fine seals, especially the one bearing text from Chuan's Mountain Spirit and Encountering Sorrow. Asked what sort of knife was used, he replied, inspiration. Several newspapers reported on the event, and some perplexed readers wanted to know where they could buy this brand of knife. Fu was a 30-year-old with mature aesthetic sensibilities when he went to Japan, though not yet a distinguished painter. His exhibition in Ginza was clearly intended to show the Japanese that China's greatness was not a thing of the past. Even as a student, he did not accept Japanese authority on all matters, especially Chinese art and history. He sometimes questions his teacher, teacher Kimbara Sego's scholarship and publicly disputed Issei Senichiro's view on Dong Chang's theory of the northern and southern schools, among other postulations. A month after the exhibition, quite a successful one, uh, in Ginza, he had to return to China to tend his dying mother and stay for good. 
From around 1937, with the outbreak of Fu Fletch War, besides needing to earn extra income, he took up painting seriously to synthesize his new artistic and art historical knowledge. From Japanese models, he sought to reclaim forgotten aspects latent in China's own tradition. For example, he enlarged upon the ink washes in Song Dynasty painting that Japanese artists had taken up. In 1956, Beijing held an exhibition on the Japanese ink painter Seshu, a Zen monk who had studied in 15th century China. Fu was the sole editor of the exhibition's well-researched and lavishly illustrated catalog. Afterwards, he produced a number of landscapes featuring splash ink techniques as exemplified by Ramblers by the Waterfall from 1960s. With a sense of rivalry, Fu showed that it was possible to engage Japanese influences without decentering one's own subjectivity, which in the context of his time was deeply nationalistic. If Japanese artists succeeded in conveying the substance of water, Fu, using his signature brush techniques, magnified the effects and lent them complexity and emotional vigor. In transcultural studies, Sarah Friedman observes that what remains covert in relation to a single national tradition and period can potentially become overt through comparative readings based on juxtaposition. Fu's Japanizing styles invited precisely this kind of comparative readings, mobilized as allegories of resistance and national pride his landscape boldly appropriated modern Japanese idioms of cultural distinction and remade them into his own, therefore, Chinese expression. As a final note, after the establishment of the People's Republic in 1949, Fu did not substantially alter his brush techniques, even as the subject had to adjust to a whole new political reality. In a painting from 1958, Fu reprised the composition of mythic ladies in rain. But this time, the figures were based on a poem by Chairman Mao Zedong. In the early communist era, Fu and others had to contend with an official bias against traditional arts. During the spring of 1950, while teaching at Nanjing University, Fu's courses in Chinese art history, Chinese painting theory, and uh, calligraphy and seal carving were abruptly canceled. He managed to continue painting more or less the way he liked until the end of his life by adopting Mao's poems as themes in the name of revolutionary romanticism. Fu apparently was the first to paint Mao's poems. This led to a selection as the co-creator of Such is the Beauty of Our Rivers and Mountains, 1959, that decorates the Great Hall of the People. In Beijing. Was art serving politics or was politics serving art? Another Mao period painting, probably Fu's most bizarre, illustrates the supreme leader swimming across the Yangtze River as a symbol of man's triumph over nature and of communist determination. However, Fu only marginally made the feat more impressive and uplifting than this photographic record of it. In fact, David Clark observes that Mao in this painting looks drowning more than conquering the river. Fu was perhaps being mischievously subversive. One could even argue that the ambivalence towards Japan expressed in the waterscapes during the War of Resistance have turned, in some sense, into an oblique critique of the new epoch. Fu Baoshi was quite a thoughtful and complex figure. 
the government censors would not have taken kindly to him during the Cultural Revolution. But fortunately, he left this world just in time. Thank you very much.